now. Detonate the reality bomb! Change has come to America. Some alien race to come down and threaten us. Is the singularity near? The military industrial conflict. The truth is out there. The seven mountains of the influencers of culture. To be as gods, you know, catapult of propaganda. From a mostly secure, undisclosed split level location on a cul de sac somewhere in the heartland of America, this is a view from the bunker. Now, here's Derek Gilbert. The prophet Isaiah tells us that there's a day coming when the earth will reel like a drunkard. Are we seeing those days? In our lifetime, welcome to A View from the Bunker. I'm Derek Gilbert. Recently, the uh, major quakes in Ecuador and Japan had some major news outlets asking that question, whether these quakes were somehow related to one another. Um, Our guest today has uh, followed quakes for a while, used to publish a, a map at his website on a regular basis showing areas of potential future quakes based on uh, deviations in heat in the ocean. Um, he is one of our favorite out-of-the-box thinkers, author of a number of books, including The Cosmic Conspiracy and uh, The Gemstone Papers, The Initial Inertial Nature of Electrical Phenomena in Ether Space. <laughs> we are proud to welcome back to the bunker, Stan Deo. Stan, uh, boy, it, it, it seems that there's hardly a day goes by that we don't see some kind of news about quakes somewhere. Uh, Oklahoma, in particular, has been suffering from more quakes than they're used to receiving. But these quakes recently in Ecuador and Japan, separated by almost 10,000 miles, uh, there, there were people asking whether these were in some way connected. Is that even possible that something on one side of the planet will affect the other side? Uh, yes, actually, especially uh, in the Pacific, around the what's called the arc of fire. They, some people call it the ring, but it's really an arc. Because that is a very fragile area uh, on the edges of the tectonic plates upon which you know, China and North and South America and Australia sit on. Now, when a major quake occurs along that, uh, that arc of fire, that uh, plate tectonic border, it can cause other earthquakes around that, um, that ring or arc to go ahead and occur, to, uh, to uh, convert from pressure to action. Um, sometimes, if it's on the other side opposite to where this big quake occurred, it might take two days or that uh, kind of aftershock on the other side of the, uh, the ring to occur. Because uh, depending on how fast the shock wave travels around that periphery, it might take um, 36 to 48 hours for the thing to release. Now, the fact that Japan had that uh, double set uh, in uh, Kyushu, in the southern island of Japan, and then we see Ecuador, we see Vanuatu. In mm-hmm. fact, Vanuatu at the moment is uh, still active. Yesterday, we had a Richter 7 there. Um, so yes, they could be connected, but because earthquakes occur within a few days of each other, it depends on their location as to whether or not they could possibly be connected. And if you look at Ecuador, it's directly across in a line straight across the Pacific to Kyushu, Japan. Hmm. And we also had, um, another quake occur, a 6.6 in Northeastern Pacific rise, which is almost in the same line between Ecuador and Kyushu. And that occurred, um, today, uh, way early in the morning. So, uh, and, and Vanuatu has now uh, had another one, about a 7.0, uh, and that was yesterday on the 28th. So these things do seem to be connected. And the thing that worries seismologists and, this, and amateur seismologists like myself is this. We know that the pressure between the major continents and the edge of the continental uh, plates or the tectonic plates it builds up around the arc of fire and it builds up to a point where suddenly it just has to release like a rubber band snapping it finally releases now you can tell the pressure with various instrumentation they have along this arc of fire all around the pacific so they've been doing that and mm, probably yeah i think we're about 56 maybe 57 years overdue for one last great release of pressure on this arc of fire, oh. and that's in the northwest of the United States at the Juan de Fuca plate off the Oregon and Washington shoreline. They predict in excess of a Richter 9 when that releases. It's going, <laughs> getting ready, straining, mm-hmm. and when it goes, we can expect tidal waves from it. Mm. Uh, that's something that we see r- reports on fairly regularly and there, there 
emergency preparedness folks up in uh, Washington, Oregon, uh, British Columbia, who are very concerned about that. How, how bad would it be? Well, looking at uh, previous occurrences of this, um, the water has gone in on as far as 120 miles up a river basin there in Oregon, I think it is. Um, the tsunamis have uh, wiped out coastal Indian villages. Um, you know, there are records of it in their totem poles and things of that nature. So, yeah, now that we're um, occupying it with high-tech power lines and, you know, roads and all the things, the mod cons, a tidal wave hitting some of the suppliers of water and power and gas could cause gas fires, electric fires, certainly will cause loss of power, chaos, you know, for days or weeks until you get power back on and, and get most of the people need help in the hospital. So uh, FEMA doesn't have enough people and materials to handle that disaster uh, all by itself. They certainly don't have enough to handle that disaster and one which might occur within a few hours or minutes of that down in California where the San Andreas Fault and all the parallel faults could get released from the shockwave of that Richter 9 plus in the Juan de Fuca plate. So it could, it could uh, impact our national economy severely. It could create um, like looting and civil disorder on a magnitude we haven't seen before as people scramble to get, you know, TV sets and whatever they do when they break into stores sure, sure. earthquake has happened. So, yeah, it, it'll be bad, um, you know, destruction of property-wise, but also uh, socially or civilly. Mm. The, the, the ring of fire is, um, well, or the arc of fire more, more properly. I'm looking at the USGS map now and uh, filtering it for that region roughly and showing magnitude 4.5 and greater over the last 30 days. And just in that area alone, they're showing 375 earthquakes of 4.5 magnitude or greater. Wait, 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 wait. Uh, you're filtering on USGS 30 days, magnitude 4.5 plus. Right. And you're saying you see how many there off the coast? Uh, th this is the whole ring of fire. This is going all the way around to the Vanuatu oh. and all around the whole ring and all the way down into South, South America. Okay, so basically, well, just, just around the Pacific, uh, that, that arc of, of fire, uh, 375. Uh, now, there was one quake in that, uh, you know, off the coast, they're saying 248 kilometers west-northwest of Ferndale, California. But I believe that's the Juan de Fuca area. Uh, it is. It's right on the toe of it. Okay, yes. That was uh, 4.6. Yep. Um, that uh, was on March 30th. Uh, but, uh, yeah, as you look around the, the western edge and the... Uh, and the South American uh, sector of this, this ring of fire. And there are little dots all over the place. Um, yeah. And w one of the things that, that struck me, and I'm looking at this as a, as a complete amateur, I, I have no clue what I'm looking at. The, the southwesternmost island of Japan, where they had the quakes there that uh, hit very close together, um, when, you, when you filter, again, for just a magnitude 4.5 or greater, uh, on the uh, the island of Kyushu, there were 50 quakes in the last 30 days of magnitude 4.5 or greater, and they seem clustered along a line that, that kind of bisects the island, which yep. is r really odd. Now, again, I don't know anything about geology, um, so I don't know if this is significant or not, but when you look at that island and look at these dots clustered along, uh, like I said, a line, that bisects the island. Is that significant? I mean, is this island trying to pull itself in half or something? Well, look, um, the, the fault line that uh, runs through there certainly is a tectonic fault line, and it is separating. If you look at the island just um, north of there that, that touches Kyushu, mm -hmm. you'll see kind of a little dark line through that. Yes. And that is sea bottom because that island has already been split. So the to suspect that Kyushu might be splitting now with all the landslides and earthquakes that have happened in the last 30 days is not, you know, incorrect. I would say that we're watching the split, the slow splitting of Kyushu. Huh. Um, now, I followed that um, fault line up to Fukushima area. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was, you know, we were, con we're concerned about Fukushima. Absolutely. I, I did some thermal imaging studies of that, sea surface temperature variations and whatever, looking for earthquake signals. And, oh, I think the day after Kyushu, I'd already forecast Kyushu would have uh, some quake activity. I didn't know how strong it would be. But the day after I did my report and I found 
three large neutral areas, but high temperature changes off the coast of uh, Fukushima, heading up toward the Aleutians and getting smaller as they went toward the Aleutians. But on the rim of those that were closest to Fukushima coast, I found signals for an earthquake. Well, sure enough, hmm. on the 19th uh, of this month, or yeah, of April, a 5.1 hit offshore uh, of Nazi Japan, Nazi, and that is in the region where that great Richter 9 hit to cause the Fukushima disaster. Hmm. So I suspect that all the way from Kyushu in the south, all the way up along that fault line, we're going to see more earthquakes. But on that, on that note about more earthquakes, when you were talking about the whole ring of fire, arc of fire, you saw that all these areas had a lot of little earthquakes, you know, threes, fours, up to big ones. But if you look at Canada and the west coast of the United States all the way down to the Baja, one quake in the last 30 days, yeah. it's almost barren, and it had one 4.6 on the 30th of March, mm -hmm. almost a month ago. Now, that tells you that area is not relieving its stress, and this is dangerous. We, uh, In fact, look at um, – We'll be having another trigger point from lunar tides in the Earth, which occur twice uh, a month in oh, the new yeah. moon. Sorry, what? No, I, okay, yeah, lunar tides. I hadn't even been thinking about the impact of the gravity of the moon on, on the Earth. Yeah, right. Okay, well, uh, if full moon occurred on the 21st of this month, and then the new moon will occur uh, um, sometime next month here. I'm just trying to see. It's full moon, first quarter. Mm, new moon on the 6th of May. So on the 6th of May, plus or minus a day, look for possible release of quakes on our West Coast. And hopefully not the big one, but um, hey, who knows? Hmm. Hmm. The, um, how, how, what are the various factors that, um, that, that can trigger quakes? Uh, and then well, I'll follow that up with uh, your, your, the, the heat map that you were looking at for anomalies in, in sea surface temperatures, uh, you know, how, how are those manifest then in signals that, that can be deciphered by scientists to try to predict where something is going to happen? Okay, well, depending upon the resolution of the data they're using to produce these sea surface temperature anomalies, the um, earthquake can be forecast by electric charges carrying heat from one side of the fault line to the other. And this only occurs on continental borders, you know, from land to ocean. It doesn't help us for earthquakes inland. Mm. But I, I noticed this back in 1996 when I was first started with Art Bell. Um, the Navy was supplying at that time to the public sea surface temperature anomaly maps, very high resolution. But their maps also, the data, they didn't tell you this, but the data included changes in electron count density on the surface of the water. Hmm. which made their maps really good for what I found. I found that from uh, maybe six hours to a week ahead of time, depending upon the, the type of formations, whether they were crystalline or dirt or whatever well, along the fault line, that when I subtracted today's sea surface temperature anomaly map from the day before, I could get little butterfly patterns along the, the fault lines over where a fault was building and starting to release because electrons would flow like piezoelectric stuff from one side to the other, transferring heat from the ocean to the land or vice versa. And that was about 80% accurate. And, you know, up until 2006, I was able to provide that service to the public and, and even to the Mexican Naval Admiralty who rang me and asked how I did it and where to get the information so they huh. could give early warning to their people. And also to 50 island states uh, that uh, contacted me uh, to help warn for their islands being hit by tsunamis. So that stopped when the uh, Navy went to a new constellation of satellites they put up. And when they went to a new super, super Cray uh, computer, mm -hmm. wrote new software. They didn't include the software to the public anyway ah. that makes the map I was using. So I've been looking since then for a sea surface temperature anomaly map that would that would still work, sort of. And I did find one probably three, four weeks back. Um, what is this, April? Yeah, around the 1st of April. I thought it was, it was funny because it was around April Fool's Day. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it did work, and it, it only works for really strong earthquakes. So when I see that and report that, you can expect a strong earthquake in the area. 
Now, I've been a bit remiss the last couple of days, been busy doing other things, but uh, I'm trying to keep an eye on the West Coast of the United States and, and Canada to see if I get that signal there, which might you know, give us a warning of a few hours to a couple of days. Mm-hmm. Well, no more than a couple of days of a big quake impending there. But that's how it worked. And it was a fluke that I, I found it just playing around with the graphics, but that's how I did it. Hmm. So what causes this, um, you said, electrical charge between the, the ocean and the land? Is there something, uh, a, a, a difference in, in, well, see, now well, I'm demonstrating mainly, my... Mainly it's pressure. It's um, pressure starting to change you know, rapidly, either up or down. Um, and, and that presses on the silicon dioxide, the quartz crystals in the rock structures underneath and produces what's called piezoelectric electric currents. Uh, I mean, if you take uh, a chunk of quartz in the dark and hit it with a hammer, you can see light flashing around inside of it, which is electrons being discharged along the lattice of the crystals. Okay. So we think that's what causes that. And, and for generations, there have been reports before big quakes that people have seen balls of light floating in the air over the fault line. And I think these are simply charged bubbles of air that have been ionized by sudden uh, release of piezoelectric uh, current by the stress on the fault. Hmm. We're, we're not only seeing earthquakes, but uh, in Kamchatka, which is also uh, on this um, arc of fire, uh, some active volcanoes at the moment that are diverting aircraft around areas where ash has been spewed into the air. Uh, all I knew of Kanchatka growing up was that it was one of the territories I had to conquer in uh, the game of risk, but, uh, <laughs> it is a, a very active area as far as, uh, volcanoes are concerned. And of course, uh, where we see that that's why they call it the ring of fire, because very often you get these uh, volcanoes that are, that are erupting and spewing out into the, uh, uh, into the atmosphere. Um, wh- what uh, connection is there between volcanic activity and earthquakes? Well, some volcanoes, when they're stressing and about to, you know, release magma up through the tubes and out into the atmosphere, uh, will um, have a bunch of, um, oh, what do they call them? They're, they're seismic tremors that occur as the magma moves up through the tube. And these are usually less than a Richter 4. They're a series of smaller quakes rumbling uh, as it's about ready to blow its top. Um, so there's that connection there. But also the other connection is that volcanoes occur usually along weak fault lines in the surface of the Earth. Mm. And surely you can see that if you look at uh, volcano maps. They pretty much follow the, the plate tectonic borders around the planet, even up inland, say like over into the Himalayas. Mm. Um, and you, you'll see activity there and all the way through into the middle of the Mediterranean, uh, through the Middle East, uh, kind of in Iran. And so they're both connected by changes in the crust, the mantle of the earth as it undergoes relief or buildup of stresses. So that's how the two are connected. Hmm. One of the areas that uh, gets a lot of attention from the, the, the press, and I've noticed over the last couple of years that, um, and especially over the last years, I've been watching the news daily so I can talk about it uh, and sound like I know what I'm saying on Skywatch TV is uh, that there are some media outlets that, that look for clickbait, sensational stuff, um, especially in, in, in Britain. Uh, websites for uh, The Express, The Sun, The Daily Mail will look for things like this. Uh, you'll see reports about UFO sightings and uh, about uh, the Yellowstone supervolcano, the caldera there at uh, Yellowstone. It seems like about every 90 days, the Express in the UK runs another story about the Yellowstone supervolcano. Uh, Ten years ago, BBC and Discovery worked together on a docudrama based on the, you know, the caldera there uh, blowing up. It seems like Yellowstone's been very like, quiet lately. Um, how significant a risk does that pose to the United States, and, and is the risk imminent, or is this something that's, you know, someday it, it might go? I think that it uh, certainly someday will go again. The thing that worries me is we have a Richter 9 building up on the northwest coast right, in right. the Juan de Fuca area, which uh, shockwise is close enough to the Yellowstone caldera, which has been rising over the last few years. It's been forming a bulge that that shockwave may be enough to trigger the release of water falling down and make a pyroclastic um, you know, steam explosion, mm. a phreatic explosion, coming up 
through Yellowstone. Um, I'm not sure whether we'll see uh, like an enormous eruption versus uh, an enormous magma flow. The magma flow would be preferred because it would be contained more in that area rather than you know a high altitude uh, emission of particulates that mm. would throw us into a nuclear winter for two years, the whole planet. Mm. And that could that could well happen. I mean, the Bible does say we'll see famine, and uh, that would hit our food basket all over the world. So, yeah, um, Yellowstone's a good thing to look at. Um, there's There are a couple of other areas uh, between there and the west coast, northwest coast, that could trigger as well. Mount St. Helens is rebuilding its uh, central core as well. Hmm. Uh, on that note, um, there was a biblical reference in the Exodus where they were talking about God sitting up on the Mount Sinai, but they called it the burning mountain. And there were rocks and things falling off the side. And they said, listen to the trumpeting, the trumpeting of the burning mountain where God sits. Okay. Hmm. I'm paraphrasing. Mm -hmm. uh, the trumpeting occurs in a volcano when it's already got an established chamber that's cooled. And it's just like a, a long tunnel down into the, the bottom of the volcano. When the magma starts to move up and it's not totally magma or exploding yet, as it moves up, the sides of it stick as it's going up this cool tunnel that's already here, that chamber. Uh -huh. And it, it sticks and grabs and then releases, and you get a vibration that makes this trumpeting sound as it ooh, goes yeah. up the top like yeah. that. So that's why people have also been hearing a lot of these strange trumpeting sounds, because those reflect off the upper atmosphere for hundreds of miles, and you hear this strange uh, trumpeting as a volcano is about to erupt putting its thing up there. That's an interesting point, because that is something that we've taken a look at. I did a program on that uh, last June and included some video from, um, I believe it was British Columbia, which really had the, uh, it, it sounded like the grinding of, of uh, freight cars in, in, a, in a rail yard from a right. distance. But you, you know, it, it just kept going and going and going. So uh, it, and it was, this was in an area where they didn't have any, <laughs> any rail line uh, apparently nearby. So the vibration of the magma moving up through this tube, essentially, and the vibration is very much like a trumpet, the, the vibration of air through, through a, a trumpet. And you'll get some variations of that, which are more sharper sounds rather than that, like a sonorous trumpet. Um, yeah, yeah. Like you're talking about the train yard. These are also occurring as areas of the surface of the earth are starting to be stressed and, and minor fault lines are starting to move against each other. Mm -hmm. Velikovsky wrote about this, I believe it was in his book, um, Earth and Chaos, or World and Chaos, or maybe Earth and Upheaval, that's what it was, where one of the pharaohs complained to his scribes at the time, when will the earth stop this moaning and groaning, this infernal noise? And that was, we think, at the time of Peleg, when the earth was splitting apart and you mm -hmm. know, things were happening in that, that respect. We, I think we're seeing this again, because the core of the earth seems to be in turbulence, according to NASA reports, where the magnetic pole poles are beginning this pole shift people have been anticipating. And I think it won't be a thousand years. It will be much less than that. It'll be in the near future. NASA also ran a supercomputer simulation of this, showing as the north and south poles start to reverse, what happens is they split into two, maybe three pairs of north-south poles that roll around inside the magma, inside the core of the planet. And, of course, this causes bulges and upheavals and a little bit of an expansion of the Earth's crust, which, of course, would explain more sinkholes, more volcanoes, more earthquakes, and the sounds you're hearing. Wow. Now, what, what impact does, does electricity or magnetic, uh, th those magnetic charges have on life as we know it? I, mean, I think we, we tend to think uh, that... Um, our lives are, are governed more or less by uh, gravity and that uh, gravity explains the, the orbit of the moon around the earth and the earth around the sun and the sun around the, uh, the core of the, the Milky way and, uh, and, and so on. And, and yet we know that there's an electrical field around the earth that protects us from the rays of the sun. And if it didn't, we'd all, well, we'd all die. Um, the, the North pole has, has been moving. Uh, it's, it's not actually at the geographic North pole. It's, it's somewhere in Hudson Bay, if I remember correctly. And, and moving at a, at a fairly fairly quick pace, isn't it? Like a kilometer a year or something like that? It's moving uh, fairly quickly, and it's moving twice the speed of the South Pole. So it's oh. a, a spinning top syndrome where okay. the 
and this is a result of a, of a large meteor impact back that caused the flood. That was the Kutapa Basin impact, 300-mile diameter crater that knocked uh, our spin from vertical to 23 and a half degrees off vertical now. The North Pole used to be over Iceland at that time, but now, of course, it's up in the areas we're talking about. Yeah, the, the, the magnetic field generates that electric field you're talking about mm -hmm. in the upper ionosphere by trapping ions and electromagnetic radiation in it. It shields us from the uh, UVC and UVB radiation uh, coming from cosmic and stellar sources uh, onto the Earth. Without that shield, it's like in Star Trek, we're totally vulnerable to attack from electromagnetic and cosmic radiation in these ranges and even gamma rays, which sadly enough, we'll get through that, that shield anyway. But that hits life, whether it be vegetation or, you know, um, living, walking life forms. You don't want to be on the surface of the earth outside of caves and stuff mm -hmm. when that happens because it will burn your skin with... Um, the UV. I've actually been under a hole in the ozone layer in, in Perth, Western Australia, and happened, and it does hurt. Mm. You feel the pin pricks like somebody stabbing with little pins everywhere, and your eyes begin to just weep from the, the brightness of the blue UVB, and UVC, of course, will kill even trees. So that's what the magnetic field does, is it protects us from a lot of the harmful radiation. But I feel that when it says in the Bible that men will hide themselves from the, the light of the sun, you know, uh, and say to the cliffs and rocks, follow me and hide me from the wrath of the Almighty, that they are trying to get shielding from what comes through a weakened magnetic field. It won't be for long, maybe a week or two, but during that time, the protection we have will disappear. Hmm. And leading up to that time, we're seeing it already, whales, birds, Animals that follow the magnetic field for the migration patterns, and you know, for mating and whatever, are are going off course because they're following magnetic fields. Uh, you know, pigeons are especially vulnerable to it with the magnetite in their brain. So these things are all interactive, and it won't happen in in an hour. It'll happen over several days, as the maybe weeks, as the fields reestablish. But during that time, you'll want to be underground or in shield, away from the ultraviolet radiation to, you know, keep from getting cancer and burns and, you know, being very nauseous because it does make you sick when it mm, hits you. Yeah. And I, w I was way low on my estimate of the speed of the movement of the north, uh, more magnetic north. It's, uh, in, in recent years, been moving as fast as 50 to 60 kilometers per year. Right. Dri okay. Drifting toward yeah. Russia. I'll put a link to this in, in the show notes so that uh, people can see it. I've got a little map here that's showing where it's moving. In fact, it apparently has moved out now outside of the area claimed by Canada in the Arctic. And it's it's heading toward Russia, <laughs> right? Right. Well, that's, yeah, the Siberian uh, prison is getting worse. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, boy, this is odd. Hmm. Um, you you mentioned the the burning mountain of of Sinai, and I'm going to use that as a, an opportunity to segue into uh, a slightly different direction for uh, a little bit. One of the things I've been reading about lately, uh, and you know, Mike Heiser is the one who kind of got me on this this track is the uh, the idea of the cosmic mountain and the the bible as a narrative of the battle over the, the cosmic mountain the struggle for the cosmic mountain and there are places in scripture that you never hear a pastor talk about um but it's it's in there when you actually look that make it apparent that there is a a a, a comparison and, and a contrast being drawn from the holy mountain of god which of course began in eden ezekiel in, in chapter 28 describes Eden as a garden, but also calls it the holy mountain of God. Of course, Sinai, where Moses received the law. And then we know that Zion, of course, is God's holy mountain now, the Temple Mount. Um, whereas we've got Mount Hermon, where the watchers came down. Uh, then there's also a mount in the north of, of Syria, which today is called Jebel el Akra, but back in ancient times was called Mount Zaphon. And that was the location of Baal's palace. There's actually a Psalm 48, I believe, that, that compares and contrasts Zion to um, Mount Hermon. Uh, and then there are other areas in Scripture where uh, we, we see uh, Lucifer as, as wanting to uh, establish his kingdom in the sides of the north. Well, that's also a reference to that Mount Zaphon, the Palace of Baal. Um, we had talked some years ago about the, the, the Tower of Babel and some art that has been preserved from the Babylonian period down to the present day, showing a ziggurat with the, you know, a, a, a 
uh, like a like a sunburst type thing at the top of the the uh, ziggurat. Um, and I, I know I'm kind of drifting, and this is this is casting a wide net here. I'm, I'm basically thinking out loud, but uh, I don't want to let the opportunity slip by while I've got you on the line here. Um, the the idea that all of history is a struggle between the fallen wanting to set up their holy mountain as the preeminent site, their their base of power, as it will, versus God's holy mountain, Zion, in, in Jerusalem, uh, just intrigues me. Um, it, but the, the idea that uh, the the ancient Sumerians and Babylonians try, and, and all over the world where we find these ziggurat or step pyramids, pyramids in Egypt, uh, seem to have passed on this, this uh, idea of the holy mountain to cultures all over the world. Um, is it, does this ring true to you? Do you have any thoughts or uh, observations on this? Yeah. Let me say, first of all, that the original mountain of God uh, was at the Garden of Eden in northern Tanzania, right. just outside the Garden of Eden. The locals still call it the mountain of God. And it's in an area of volcanic field of volcanoes from Kilimanjaro right on around the Nguru itself. Now, that area was full of hot stones, and it does mention... Uh, Satan walking upon the hot stones of Eden. So yes, that was yes. The original, that and was it, the original it, tower, you know, and it's still it's still erupting. It's the only uh, what they call natron volcano erupting on the surface of the planet. It's still enduring. Um, and as I've mentioned before, it's odd this natron volcano. The the temperature of it is half that of the other volcanoes in the world. But huh. yet, what it's what it's making from its magma. About 13% of it is what you'll find in Alka-Seltzer. You know, so God gave us a, a, an Alka-Seltzer for the pains of <laughs> coming. <laughs> okay, but anyway, now going back over to all right, the, the, uh, the various mountains, uh, Mount Sinai, which is in uh, south, um, oh, south, e- southwestern um, Saudi Arabia, uh, near Jabal al is right next to it, in fact. Mm-hmm. It's a high place. And when you look at Mount Hermon, that's a high place. Yes. When you look at, uh, you know, uh, the... Uh, the one up in Syria, high place. Yes. And so Nimrod and his troops or his people were building a tall ziggurat. And as it says in, 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 in the biblical account, uh, Nimrod was trying to reach up to become as one of them. It says, let us go down and confuse their language lest they become as one of us coming up on that tower. Mm-hmm. So it does say, it does imply that the interface between God's universe and ours is in the high places of the earth. Um, uh, the, I think that the, the holy mountain of God will become Zion, or if not already called that, but it will become that in Israel. And here's the reason. Israel, the name, um, the name given to, to Jacob was this, Israel. Mm-hmm. And you translate that in the old Hebrew, it means make straight the pathway of God. Mm. And this is what John the Baptist was yelling in the desert, Israel, Israel. And so to make straight the pathway coming from where God's kingdom is to ours would probably be a high place. However, since the time of Moses, we have seen that God's energy, the the density of his molecules, the energy crammed in there, is so much greater than the average molecules here on our earth that he could not uh, appear in front of Moses without the shielding of the mountain to, to talk to, and, and to Moses and show him how he looked because it would kill Moses. Mm-hmm. So he said, let me put my image up on this cloud, a hide in this cleft of the rock here, and so you're not hurt, but, but peek out and see my image on that cloud. That was the only way he could show him. From, from the time of the Genesis uh, account of the Garden of Eden, uh, God walked and, and talked with Adam and Eve. God walked and talked with Noah. But in the time of Moses... He could not because it would destroy Moses. The disparity between God's universe and ours is growing, growing, growing until, as the revelation of John says, at the end of the millennial period, the heavens and the earth will pass away in this mm-hmm. great heat, but we be, be replaced with a new heaven and a new earth. So this is telling you that our universe is an entropy, severe entropy. We're running down, and it is so distant from God's kingdom that it will be destroyed when God's kingdom consumes it and builds a new one. I have heard a theory that uh, that time is actually literally winding down 
it, it, time is, is moving more slowly now than, than it did in the uh, moments immediately after the creation. Um, and that, uh, th- that may be a, a one aspect of this, this change, this uh, manifestation of entropy, or, or the process of entropy, rather, a- as we are uh, tending toward a, a greater state of chaos. Um, I, I also find it interesting, as I'm looking at the USGS map, that uh, there is a uh, fault line that runs just to the east of Jerusalem. And that uh, <laughs> it, it, we are told that when, when Christ returns and he sets his feet down on the Mount of Olives, it's going to split in two. Um, right. Yeah. Right. All connected. Hmm. All connected. You know, time, by the way, it's one of the papers uh, that I have not published yet, but time is a dimensionless ratio. When you think about it, we compare distances. Distances, say, that a, a cesium atom expands and contracts. Uh, distance that a, an arm of a grandfather clock goes bang, 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 while we're doing something at a different rate to that. So we're covering distances of, say, a trip overseas to so many distances of the swing of the grandfather clock or the change in radius of the cesium atom or whatever. So in essence, time is a pure ratio. And to say that it's slowing down per se um, would mean that the the ratio is changing. Changing uh, relative to, to, you know, God who is immutable and unchangeable. Um, for, right. for those of us who are inside this time-space continuum, we would not recognize it, um, I, I, I expect. In fact, that was a, th- there was a recent um, symposium where a number of uh, well-known scientists, you know, MIT, Harvard, and so forth, got together. Some were astrophysicists, a couple were philosophers, and the uh, topic they discussed during the symposium was whether we are living in a simulation, a holographic simulation. Right, and I think the philosopher had the most intelligent observation, which was this: if we were living in a observation, uh, or, I mean, in a, a, a simulation, we wouldn't know because all of the evidence would also be simulated. So <laughs> we, we wouldn't True. be able to tell. True. So uh, that way lies madness. I mean, I think the main point is that God created us and put us in this time-space continuum. This is reality. I mean, regardless of whether it's only a subset of a greater reality or not, this is the reality in which God intended us to live. Uh, not at first. I mean, we, we kind of blew that when Adam and Eve fell in the garden. But um, since then, you know, this this is what we've been constrained to. So, you know, just to argue that this is just a hologram and not real reality, you know, okay, let the New Agers have that uh, uh, little little belief. Um, we're here in this, uh, in this box, as it were, until uh, Jesus comes and... Uh, and sets us free. Um, yeah, there, there are so many aspects of this that are that are j- just intriguing and fascinating. I, I the um, back to the concept of the, the holy mountain. Um, w- one of the things that that I found really intriguing w- was that uh, the the narrative is there in scripture if you ch- if you choose to look for it, and and yet I, I'd never heard it preached in any of the churches that I attended. Uh, there was an aspect of the the Exodus that. Um, is connected to the very famous story of Moses leading the Israelites across the Red Sea. But it's a detail that I had never heard anyone, uh, a, a preacher, pastor, evangelist, expound on, which is that just before they crossed, God told Moses to turn back. He had to turn the column of Israelites around because he wanted them to encamp at a place called Pi Haharoth, opposite Baal Zephon, which is a reference to, again, that Mount Zephon in the north of Syria. You know, why would, why would Yahweh tell them to do that? And, and for, for that matter, why was Baal even being worshipped in Egypt when he was a Canaanite deity? Well, it turns out, if you know your history, which I do, I just kind of separate it out into a box instead of looking at it, you know, as a cohesive whole, that uh, for a period of time, right around the time of the, uh, the sojourn in Egypt, uh, the Egyptians were under the control of a group called the Hick- Hyksos who were Canaanites who came in and basically dominated the Delta region. And of course they brought their God with them, Baal. And so there was this place on the Red Sea that was sacred to Baal, who was supposed to be the God of maritime navigation. And Yahweh made a point. Not only was he going to cross 
the sea there showing that, no, Baal, you're not the, the God of the sea or maritime navigation. That's Yahweh. And oh yeah, all of these Baal worshipers that are following my people to try to kill them, they're going to be killed by the thing that you're supposed to be the God of. Uh, it, there is a long history, if we choose to look at it, of divine warfare, warfare taking place in the heavenlies that is so often stripped out of the preaching that we hear in our churches. And I, I just, it, I, I sometimes marvel now that my eyes have been open to this, that that more pastors, more preachers, more evangelists don't see this and don't talk about it. Yeah, uh, for some reason, I too have uh, been researching the Exodus path again in the last month and did find um, that spot, that crossing you're talking about. I, I looked at the names of the places mentioned, Pirhiroth and Belzephon and Migdal, Mm-hmm. Migdal means a very tall place, and the only tall place on the Egyptian delta there along the Nile is uh, a structure at uh, the the area where the Suez Canal starts from the uh, the left wing or the left leg of the Red Sea. Mm-hmm. And, the Gulf of Suez, yeah. Yeah. yeah and now, I've, I'm, I'm going to send you, um, I've, I've sent you two pictures that you can use that I got off of Google Earth of the crossing spot. Uh, that the Exodus took, and there's a little red line showing how they went on up into the wilderness of sin and over into uh, Medea, uh, where they uh, met with uh, Jethro. But anyway, if you look at that, you will see that Israel had its back up to the wall against Migdal, and at the crossing place of Belzephon, you can see how they were trapped by Egypt, and there was no way out except through the water. And that's how God said, there, although there's no way out, I will take you across here. Exactly. And form this great great typhoon um, or like a, a, vol- a, a tornado over the top of Israel to protect them during the night because they were inside of it in the middle where there's no vacuum. And then they were taken across uh, the, the Reed Sea as the typhoonous, they were called typhoon, uh, reeds were separated and dried mm-hmm. so that Israel could come across. So it, it really, it all makes sense, you know, strategically uh, and geographically, it makes sense to have this as the crossing place, yeah. like you said. And of course, then, uh, there, like I said, there's also a, a spiritual component too, because God said, you look, turn back. I want you to go back to this place here. And I just can't help but imagining, you know, the poor schlub at the very end of the line, seeing the clouds of dust from the Egyptian chariots or the Hyksos chariots, because the Egyptians didn't have chariots until the Canaanite Hyksos brought them in. Uh, but anyway, seeing the, the, the clouds of dust coming from this, this the most powerful military in the ancient Near East, and Moses said, what? <laughs> yeah. And of course, then their first confrontation against Baal was when they got to um, the region of Moab, and uh, they fell into the sin at uh, Baal Peor. Where, um, well, anyway, that's a yeah. whole, whole other story there. But uh, uh, the uh, presentation that you gave at the 2014 conference in Colorado Springs was was eye opening uh, with the location of the uh, the the Garden of Eden and the research you just described about the crossing of the Red Sea. Does this pertain to what you're going to discuss in Colorado Springs this coming July? Um. Probably not. Um, there's just not enough time. I, I wanted to, but um, I'm going to deal more with the flood and with the discovery of Atlantis and how that fits into Genesis uh-huh. 6 and uh, what caused the flood. I've actually found the real cause of the great flood of Noah, and it, it is a miraculous thing to, to, to analyze. It was a meteor impact, but the path of it definitely headed straight for Atlantis and the hybrid beings you know, that the fallen angels had made with human women. It went straight for that area, which was the Saudi Peninsula, and sank the southern half of it and pushed up the northern half of it and created a flood. The rain, in fact, came from the steam that came up from this impact meteor Mm. into the upper atmosphere and condensed into rain over 40 days and nights. So anyway, I'm going to discuss more of that than of the Exodus, but certainly at question time, maybe in the... the, uh, lecture I'm going to be doing on Holly's new book, The um, uh, Prophetic Perils, uh, that I will be able to mention that in in that part of the lecture. I'm not sure if I have time, but I'll try. Well, we had wondered what you could possibly do to even come close to topping uh, the location of Eden, but this sounds like it would be right up there. So I'm not sure how my time will 
be scheduled while we're there because I'm probably going to be doing a lot of the interviews as I did in 2014. But if I can sneak out and, and watch your presentation, uh, I will definitely uh, make it there. And I'll, I'll point out to folks listening that uh, the live stream option is available again this year. So you'll have an opportunity if you can't make it to Colorado Springs in July to watch the presentation in real time, and it will be archived for six weeks thereafter. Uh, direct you to the website of our friends at Prophecy Watchers, prophecywatchers.com to check that out. But uh, we'll definitely look forward to that. Uh, Stan, I know you're uh, on a schedule today, and I appreciate you Let me take some time out of your schedule today to talk about this. And uh, um, again, I, I guess in, in the interest of, of bringing this around to where and how God might use these changes in the earth, earthquakes, volcanoes, the pole shift, uh, looking at some of the uh, catastrophic events in earth's history, um, it's, it's easy, I think, for people to look at things like that and, and, and grow very afraid and, and concerned for what might be coming in the future. Um, how should we take this as Christians? How do we process this information? Well, look, um, I think it's pretty natural for people to, uh, especially for Christians, to realize that we're going to go to a better place once we leave the world. Mm -hmm. But uh, choosing the manner of which you leave uh, is a little bit of a a fearful thing. You know, you might not want to be thrown off a tall building or drown or whatever. (laughs) But other than that, look, you're going to be facing that uh, as you die, whatever God has planned for you anyway. So don't be fearful of that as part of the judgments coming. Uh, the Lord is going to take uh, the, the church out at some point in a rapture. So those that have not yet died will be transferred out of their bodies into a spirit form in the rapture and out of here. So don't be fearful of that. Be aware that this is the end of ages and ages of conflict as far as you know, Satan, uh, Lucifer, and God, and us who follow God against the evil of, of Lucifer. We still have a thousand years to go, uh, mm. the earth does. And there will be a repopulation of the earth. And then one last final release of Lucifer and his minions from the the prison for one last great battle at the end of that thousand-year reign. So let's not be fearful of this. Just be understanding that this is telling us it's almost over. The, The conflict for us is almost over. Be encouraged. Yeah, look up. Our redemption draws near. Absolutely. Stan Dale, uh, where do people find your work? Where's the best way place for people to follow your work? Let me put it that way. Well, on our, sh- our, our main website, uh, the, the main page is standeo.com, S-T-A-N-D-E-Y-O.com. And just underneath the pictures of books and DVDs and stuff that Holly and I present, uh, there's a little blue microphone, graphic-looking microphone. And to the right of that, it says show images. And underneath, it shows you know recent lectures or interviews and things like that. So go there, and I update the show images page every week uh, on Tuesday at least, uh, as I do the the Hagman Hagman show. Mm-hmm. Now that I, I change that every week, so you need to look at it and maybe screen grab or save that uh, that page if you want to save any of the images uh, and links I've put up there for that week. But you'll keep current with what I'm finding and discovering right there. In fact, for the last six weeks, I've been covering aspects of the Antichrist of Saudi Arabia and uh, of the uh, discovery of Atlantis and the meteor that impacted to cause the Great Flood. Mm. So you've probably missed all that so far, but it'll be in the lecture. Well, uh, very good. We look forward to seeing that. And uh, again, thanks for your time today, Stan, and uh, look forward to seeing you and Holly in July. Thank you, Derek. We'll see you and Sharon there. Stan and Holly Deo post everything they do at the website standeo.com, S-T-A-N-D-E-Y-O. Dot com, standale.com. And there'll be a link in the show notes, of course, at vftb.net, where we post show notes for all of the programs going back um, six years now. So you'll find all of those uh, there at vftb.net. A couple of things to uh, talk about today, and one I think that's very timely given the discussion that uh, Stan and I just had. And this was a uh, story that was sent to us by uh, George. Thank you very much for that. That's, this is also going to show up, I'm sure, on uh, Sci Friday on Skywatch TV this, uh, this week. And uh, it is a report that researchers have discovered that the Earth's mantle is moving much, much faster than they previously thought. That convection currents inside the Earth's mantle are moving not nearly as far. Uh, they thought that uh, the, these convection currents deep in the Earth moved up and down as much as uh, 10,000 kilometers 
Now they believe it's only a thousand kilometers, but apparently like when you put your thumb over the hose, <laughs> um, the, um, uh, the, you know, fewer, lesser movement means greater pressure or something because these currents apparently are moving a lot quicker. And the net result is that the uh, Earth's surface may move up and down a lot more than was previously thought. Like by as much as five kilometers over the course of, well, in in the scope of the standard accepted time scale of uh, Earth's history, millions of years. Now, physicist Barry Setterfield has made an interesting case that I won't try to describe here because I'm not going to do it justice. I won't get it right. But uh, it says that there, there are reasons to believe that the apparent age of the rocks that we find um, on Earth aren't really as old as they appear to be because time is essentially slowing as uh, we get closer to the end of time. Um, and, and he's done a really good presentation on, on DVD. Uh, you, you really should check out his website, setterfield.org. Um, you'll find that he explains it far better than I do. And um, you know, we'll see if, we've, if he's feeling up to uh, an interview about that, because this would be a really fascinating discussion. But anyway, um, the, the surface of the earth, because of these new uh, discoveries that researchers have made, uh, again, moving a lot more and a lot faster than uh, previously thought. And again, uh, a, a vertical shift in some of the points in the earth by as much as five kilometers, which is what, like three miles? I mean, it's, it's a lot. <laughs> that's a, that's that's a, a huge change. So um, once again, science uh, coming up with a new discovery that shows that they don't know as much or as completely about any particular thing as they think they do, because this overturns what was previously held to be the consensus about the movement uh, of magma within the crust. Uh, another big story that we did talk about on Sci Friday last week which uh, made big news, which is a biotech firm that has announced it's received permission to begin trials on volunteers who um, are on life support. And now, obviously, these are the families of these people who are making these, they're volunteering them for this this, uh, groundbreaking study. Um, The the goal of this uh, team is to kind of reboot the... um, The brain, in a sense, a first step toward reanimating the dead. That's what they're hoping to accomplish here. Uh, The company is called BioQuark. It's based in Center City, Philadelphia. And uh, the lead researcher is a a doctor named Ira Pastor, who was interviewed in The Telegraph in the UK. So this isn't something coming from Weekly World News. This is something that received mainstream coverage uh, the Telegraph is a pretty serious newspaper in Britain. It's not uh, one of those over there that you kind of have to, you know, put uh, <laughs> uh, duct tape over the side of your computer screen because of the stuff that they run in the sidebar, the clickbait that they run in the sidebar. Uh, no, the Telegraph is a pretty serious uh, paper. Now, I don't know about BioQuark and how serious this company is. It's described as an American biotech company. But the photos that were run... Uh, And I believe this was, uh, we picked the story off of um, uh, MSN, I believe, MSNBC. Um, Ira Pastor and one of the other researchers, a Dr. Antoinette Dutois, who's, uh, I believe, South African, look like models. And I I don't know about you, but there are very few doctors, I mean, serious researchers I've, I've run across and it, and it doesn't mean that the bio, that this company is um not for real it may well be it just sends up a yellow flag for me when when the lead researchers in something of this type research of this type trying to reanimate uh through well what you know stem cell research i don't know i i, I don't really understand how they're hoping to do this but trying to reanimate dead tissue people who are clinically or are cl- brain dead considered brain dead um, you don't normally find people who look like they should be pursuing a career in modeling, fronting the company. So I'm just wondering, and I could be wrong, if if this company is just there to get a lot of <laughs> financing because this is certainly an area 
where people with the money to spend are willing to put their money. You know, like the old joke, everybody, want, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Uh, anyone who comes up with a uh, even marginally plausible claim to be able to turn back aging or even reverse death is um, has got a good chance of becoming a very, very wealthy person. So we'll see what comes of this. We'll keep our eyes on this. The company, again, BioQuark from Philadelphia and apparently receiving permission. And here's the other yellow flag for me. The uh, permission uh, for these trials, I believe, is coming from the government of India. So the trials will be conducted there, not here in the United States, not not here in the United States. So again, just just another yellow flag there. Maybe this isn't all what it seems to be from the news headline. Um, one other thing, and it's a topic that is well. Let's let's put it this way: if the horse isn't dead, we are certainly beating an equine that is on life support. Uh, and this is the issue of uh, LGBT rights. We talk about it from time to time because it, at its core, is an assault on God's design for humanity. In the beginning, created he them male and female. And our children and grandchildren are being indoctrinated by the media, by their education system, and, and now by the Obama White House. Certainly, this is coming from the top, that you can be whatever you want to be male, female, or other. Um, The uh, Justice Department of the Obama White House has decided to file a suit against the state of North Carolina for the so-called bathroom bill, HB2, the Public Facilities um, Privacy and Security Act, I believe it was called. It was the bill that was passed in response to a law in the city of Charlotte, an ordinance passed by the city of Charlotte to um, require anyone with restroom facilities open to the public to um, guarantee that uh, transgendered persons can use the bathroom that corresponds with their gender identity rather than with their biological sex. And as you can Expect If you're listening to this program, you're probably predisposed to respond the same way I did, which is, um, you know, what what is the City Council of Charlotte thinking? I mean, for one thing, this is a government overreach into the rights of private property owners because the bill didn't apply to public facilities, government-run facilities. This applied to restaurants, gas stations, um, health clubs. Uh, you know, uh, bars, anywhere, you know, uh, stores, clothing stores, anywhere where there might be a restroom facility open to the public, the owner of that privately owned property would have been required by the city of Charlotte to make it available to whoever wanted to use the restroom. And the state of North Carolina stepped in and said, no, we will not require that you do not have the right to um, impose that on um, private property owners now this did, the, the North Carolina law does not prohibit the owners of private property from opening the restrooms to whoever they want they're just leaving it to the choice of the private property so if a restaurant owner or a nightclub owner feels that their clientele is best served by allowing transgender customers to use the restroom in which they feel most comfortable, then that's up to them. But as we've heard, you know, the uh, progressives uh, have adopted their point and shriek uh, strategy against the state of North Carolina, and the Obama administration is joining in on this. North Carolina and uh, Governor McCrory there have turned around and countersued the government. Or perhaps, the, actually, I think it's the other way around. I think the state sued the federal government first, and then the federal government turned around and countersued North Carolina. But either way, um, this is going to be resolved in court. So now, suddenly, it is now a national issue, because once the precedent is set, it will then be applied all across the nation. States' rights, what states' rights? Now, as I've said before, as the father of a uh, young woman, I would feel much more comfortable knowing that 
a, a preoperative transgender or a, a guy who just wanted to wants to claim that he's transgender is not going to be protected from being bounced out on his ear if he chooses to use the restroom or the shower if it's at a health club at the same time as young women like my daughter. Um, but we, we, as I said, we, we've hashed this issue out. You know where I stand on this. I don't have a problem with the people who are in that lifestyle per se. And I want to be clear about this. My, my problem with the activists who are promoting the transgender lifestyle is that they are encouraging people um, who are mentally ill to avoid treatment. The American Pediatrics Association recently released a policy paper in which they said people who firmly believe that they are something that they biologically are not are mentally ill and should be treated as such. And research has shown that when children and teens who express a desire to be the opposite sex are left alone, the vast majority of them, upwards of 75% of the girls and upwards of 90% of the boys, eventually grow out of it if they're left alone. So what activists are doing is taking these young people Going through a difficult time of life, I mean, you get into your teen years, you're confused, period. Gender confusion is just one aspect of your confusion. But you eventually, hopefully, grow out of it. But now you've got a whole movement encouraged by the media, encouraged by you know, icons of pop culture, musicians and movie stars, and now the President of the United States and his administration Encouraging people to go into this lifestyle, a lifestyle in which two out of five will try to kill themselves. That's the tragedy here. And just on a, on a governmental level, doesn't the Justice Department have more to worry about than who gets to use which bathrooms in the state of North Carolina? That's a rhetorical question. The answer is yes, it does. So anyway, um, we'll see how this plays out. But just be prepared because this is an issue that 10 years ago I would not have envisioned uh, being a front burner social issue in the United States. I mean, 10 years ago when here in the state of Missouri we voted to make the definition of marriage a part of the state constitution. And I shouldn't have to explain that. There is only one definition of marriage, and that is one man and one woman. But thanks to legal activists and and activist judges, that's been overturned by the Supreme Court of the United States. I mean, I thought the issue was settled 10 years ago. (laughs) I was naive. I never thought the issue of you know, allowing boys into the girls' locker rooms in school would become a civil rights issue. And frankly, and I don't mean any disrespect to any group here, but if I were African American, I would be offended at the LGBT activists who are trying to equate the the <laughs> the issue of gender dysphoria with the issue of racial inequality. But again, maybe I was just naive. So, well, watch for that, because that will continue to be an issue as um, the months and years progress. And, and I've, got, I've got to say that uh, these uh, never-Trump su- activists inside the Republican Party, um, <laughs> if, if only on this particular issue, if you think that voting for Donald Trump is no different than uh, voting for Hillary Clinton, um, <laughs> I really have to question your your political acumen. I I just don't see it. Well, next week, um, and by the way, apologies for for going off on such a long rant on this, but uh, once I start on this issue, it it really makes me angry. And again, it's not over the, the, the moral issue here. It's because we've got a generation of children coming up, um, many of whose, whom are, are going to find their lives essentially hijacked by these activists. Our daughter, when she was young, was a tomboy. Her best friends were all boys. 
in today's world, she might well have had teachers, counselors, and government busybodies sticking their nose into my family's business, telling us that we should raise her as a boy and start hormone treatments and push her into a lifestyle where, again, 40% of the people try to kill themselves. And it's not because people outside the lifestyle are hating on them. It's because, as psychologists, pediatricians, and those who've come out of the lifestyle will testify, it's because it is at heart a morbidity. It is a condition that requires treatment. Anyway. Um. Also, I want to apologize for this program going up late. I hope to have this posted on Sunday, try to keep to a weekly schedule on Sundays. And um, for the second time in the last month, I brought home the wrong audio from the office, so I wasn't able to work on it on Sunday. I mean, I could have made the drive into the office and gotten it, but we had things to do around the house as well, so trying to fit it into the schedule. So uh, thought I would be able to do it here at the office yesterday, but we had a couple of maintenance things at home. And I was waiting on contractors, so I didn't get into the office as early as I would have thought. So, again, my apologies for the delay and my apologies to Stan for not posting this when I said I would. But uh, we are looking forward to seeing his presentation at the uh, Rocky Mountain International Prophecy Conference. And uh, if you won't be there, hope that you will take advantage of the live stream option. 25 speakers, there'll be 32 messages that will be broadcast in real time via the Internet. And then all of those messages, all 32 will be archived for six weeks after the conference. If you want more information about that, you'll find it at prophecywatchers.com. That's where you can sign up for that. Um, There will be no view from the bunker this coming weekend. The weekend of uh, May 14th and 15th, we'll be out of town um, visiting with family. So um, rather than try to pack more into a week that's already busy because we've got another guest coming in for skywatch tv on thursday a guest that you will want to hear in fact opal singleton whom you have heard on this program um if we have time i will grab her for a vftb but won't have time to produce it before the weekend Uh, but opal singleton will be uh, recording a couple of shows for skywatch tv that will broadcast in uh, probably july maybe june but possibly july Uh, but you you definitely will want to see those programs um So, we'll be back on the 22nd of May, God willing. And the same holds true for the Gilbert House Fellowship Weekly Bible Study. We're taking a break from that for a week as well, and we'll return with a New Testament and Old Testament study, one of each, on Sunday, May 22nd. We've got uh, the Gilbert House Fellowship, by the way, added to Stitcher. So, if you are a Stitcher user, you can now get... um, the Gilbert House Fellowship, as well as a view from the bunker. And we appreciate your reviews there and on iTunes for both programs. Helps them show up a little higher in their search algorithms. So uh, thank you very much for taking the time to do that. And uh, if you want to discuss the issues raised here on the program, you can do that at the View from the Bunker page on Facebook. Look us up there, and there's a link to it in the show notes at vftb.net. A View from the Bunker is a production of Gilbert House and released under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License. The opening theme is by Kevin McLeod. His website is incompetech.com. And we do this because we wrestle not against flesh and blood. I'm Derek Gilbert, and this is A View from the Bunker. Mm-hmm.